everyone, it's Sari, and I'm here live this morning at Higher Vision Church. Whether you're joining us through our website or YouTube or Facebook, we're so glad that you call Higher Vision your home. Now let's tune in to today's message here at Higher Vision Church. All right. Well, we're going to dive into the message today, and I've entitled... Um, this sermon, we're not doing a full series. Normally in, in December, we start talking about Christmas. And I decided to wait one week because I felt prompted by God to share a, a special one sermon series called Unleashed. So we're not going to focus on Christmas. We're going to start next week with that and go for three weeks on it. But this, this passage that we're about to read, I think it's powerful. And I think this message is going to be life changing for so many. So I want you to do this. Would you stand to your feet? We're going to read this verse together. Everybody say, unleashed. And now, here's what I'd like you to do. You know, we have an incredible crowd of people that are here this morning. But not only that, we have people joining us in Stockholm, Sweden, in Latvia, Massachusetts, Arkansas, Arizona, Malibu, Nalibu. Uh, Nalibu, did I just say? Napa, thank you. Arizona, Utah, Kansas, all over LA County. We have people right here in the valley that are watching. Come on, give a hand to your church family. Come on, make them feel welcome. We're glad you're with us. And I had a story of someone who shared in our team rally before services that we have a family right now that is driving two and a half hours. They moved away, but their kids are so loved in our children's ministry and our special needs ministry. They'll make the two and a half hour drive one way to get to church. How many know that's some commitment right there? You know what that says? That says that this is a place that's filled with love. So I want us to read this passage where Jesus addresses this issue of being unleashed. It's found in John chapter 8. I'm going to read for a little bit, and then I'll ask you to join me. To the Jews who had believed in him. So in other words, these are uh, Jews who believed in Jesus. Believers. He said, if you hold to my teachings, you are really my disciples. Then you'll know the truth and the truth will set you free. They answered him, we're Abraham's descendants and have never been slaves of anyone. How can you say that we should be set free? Jesus replied, very truly I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now I want everyone to read this last part with me. Because if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Come on, somebody say unleashed. I want you to close your eyes. Lord, I pray that you will speak through this message. You'll speak through these words. I pray for every heart of every person that's joining us, whether it's online or here in this room, and that you would speak truth to us. Lord, knowing truth is when we get set free. So Lord, we don't just want to hear it, we want to know it. Will you say this with me? Say, Lord, I want to be free. Jesus' name. Somebody shout amen. You may be seated today. As I pondered this passage of scripture, it made me think of something and of, of uh, something that many of us have. How many of you here have a pet? If you have a pet, raise your hand. Even if it's a pet rock, you can raise your hand. Um, now, we have, how many ask this question? How many have dogs? How many dog lovers in the house? All right. How many cat lovers? Boo. I heard some of you saying boo, so I just voiced it. Um, not really. I don't want to bag on you if you love cats. I'm sorry for you. Um, so I had a dog um, whose name was Bruiser. And one of the things that Bruiser had a propensity to was he was a good dog. When you'd call him, he'd come to you and he did lots of little tricks and stuff. He'd, you know, shake your hand and sit and so on. But if the door opened, something happened to Bruiser. He was like, Phew! he was gone. He was just out the door. And when he was outside... He just wouldn't come to you. You had to chase him down. So whenever we would go for a walk or we'd go outside, we would have what was called a leash. Now, this is more a different one, but the kind we used to have were the, just like a piece of material, you know, a strip of material that was kind of strong. It had a leash, a little lock on the end, a clasp. And so normally you'd put that on bruiser, and when you'd put it on bruiser, um, immediately there was tension, and he knew that he couldn't go anywhere, that he had a boundary, how many know that our dogs sometimes push their boundaries? How many have had kids that push the boundaries? And um, 
Uh, you know, we love Bruiser, by the way. Bruiser, a couple years ago, we had to put him to sleep. But praise the Lord, Bruiser's in heaven because we know that all dogs go to heaven. Um, I feel sorry for you people that have cats. We won't talk about that. Um, uh, I don't know why I feel like bagging on cats today. I had a rough morning, so just stay with me. So this um, one morning when I was going to take Bruiser for a walk with the normal leash, the vet says, oh, wait, hold, I got you something. And she opens up the, the little counter and pulls out this new technology. It, was, it wasn't, didn't look like a normal leash. It was a, had a clasp and it had the, if you hold down the button, you could, you know, it was like a leash, you know, could, you couldn't go anywhere. But if you didn't hold the button, there was like this long string that just went for like 15 feet. And if you, in, at whatever length you want, you just push down and it would hold there. I'm like, wow, this is so cool. So, of course, I take Bruiser outside and I clasp on the leash and I put it on. And as I do, he, of course, is expecting a boundary. And he kind of does his little, when he goes like this, there's no tension. And so what does he do? He takes off. I mean, like, I mean, figure it out that when you want your dog, they run faster than any other time the moment you reach down to pick them up, they're so fast. And so bam, he took off because he thought he was free and he took off and he was running, he was running, running, but we didn't realize it's 15 feet into his run, full speed, there was a boundary and of course you know the sound that came ah, like that and you're like this and because here's the point, Bruiser thought he was free but he was really just on a longer leash. And I believe that there's a lot of Christians who maybe think they're really free, but really they're just on a longer leash. Because you've been forgiven of your sins, but you still are allowing habits, sinful habits in your life that maybe you wouldn't call it a problem, but there's some dependency on alcohol or in drugs or maybe you are struggling with a dependency and, a, and you have an issue of anger or maybe it's unforgiveness or maybe it's spending or maybe it's gambling or, or it could be pornography or maybe overeating but there's a lot of Christians that think they're free but they've been forgiven and they're still on a longer leash and I want you to know today that Jesus addresses in this passage some important truths and so I want to give you three quick uh, principles from the passage we read, and then we're going to talk about how do we experience freedom? How can we be unleashed? Because I want to tell you something. God has not intended you to be on a leash. He's not intended you to be bound to those propensities of habit and sinful nature of, of gossip or of whatever it might be. God has better for you. He wants you to be unleashed. Come on, somebody say unleashed. So here we go. We're going to take this story, this passage, and I'm going to give you three quick principles. Principle number one, if you're taking notes, write this down. If you're not taking notes, have your neighbor write it down and give it to you after <laughs> the point. Number one, it's possible for Christians to be in bondage. Wait a minute, I'm a Christian, Pastor, and when I'm a Christian, everything's changed. Yes and no. You are a Christian. You've been forgiven of your sins. But it's possible for a Christian to still be in bondage. Let me show you what this passage tells us. It begins by making something clear because Jesus is talking about how people get bound to sin and then he can set them free. So it begins by making sure we understand who he's talking to, to the people who believed in him. So believers of Christ, Jesus goes on to tell them, I tell you the truth, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. I don't know about you, but maybe you've seen people who you looked up to or who were a believer or a Christian who you thought really was a, a strong believer, and then suddenly, boom, you find out stuff that they're involved in or things they're doing. And the first thought that often people say when they bring to me as a pastor is like, Pastor, I thought they were a Christian. And the reality is they may be a Christian, but sometimes Christians can be in bondage. Because here's the reality. When you come to Christ... Christ he forgives you and sets you free from the penalty of sin. But how many know we still live in a world with the presence of sin? And if we're not careful, we can allow ourselves to still be under the power of sin. That's why Paul says in Galatians, he addresses this issue. In Galatians chapter 5, he says, So Christ 
has set you free. We've been set free. But here's the deal. Now, make sure you, what does it say? Stay free free and do not get tied up again in slavery to the law. You see, the reality is, is Jesus comes along and what does he do? He takes that little clasp and he sets us free. And we're forgiven of our sins and of the penalty of our sins. But then you and I, not realizing it, not on purpose, but we start falling back into our patterns of addiction and issues in our lives. And we take that clasp and we put it back on there. And instead of being free, we're in bondage because Christians can be in bondage. Let me give you the second thing that we see in this passage. And that is, it's difficult to admit you're in bondage. Nobody wants to admit that they have an issue, a stronghold. We see it in the passage where Jesus is, is talking, right? He says, hey, listen, I came to set you free. And they said, it. Um, wait, wait a minute. They answered him, we're Abraham's descendants and have never been slaves to anyone. How can you say that we should be set free? Come on, let me ask you a question. How many of you have ever talked to someone and they're just like talking crazy talk? Come on, maybe it's your, your aunt at... Thanksgiving after a little bit too much to drink. Come on, I mean, you know what I'm talking about. Or, or just, they're just talking crazy. I mean, if you have your kids just talk crazy. An example would be like someone who has a sports team that has a horrible record and they're terrible and, and they're going to play your team, which is awesome, that has a great winning record and then they start talking to you and telling you they're going to beat you. It's crazy talk. Come on, you know what I'm talking about. It doesn't make sense. Because when we read this, that's what happened. Because think about who he's talking to. He's talking to the Jewish people. I wonder if in Jesus' mind, he's thinking, hello, McFly, do you not remember the land of Egypt? Where for 400 years you were slaves? Do you not remember that even the, the culture you live in right now You're not a free nation that the Romans have conquered you and you're a slave nation to a conquering nation? Wah, 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 wah. Crazy talk. Now we read that and we think, (laughs) can you believe they said that? And the reality is that we say the same thing all the time. I don't have a problem. I have it under control. Well, that's not really an issue in my life. You know, I just, from time to time. And we do the same thing because nobody wants to admit, it's difficult to admit when we're in bondage. I remember talking to someone several years ago and they were struggling um, with going out and partying and, 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 and drinking and alcohol and, and I met with them and I kind of addressed it and said, hey, listen, bro, you're going to have to, and they're like, listen, man, I don't have a problem. I just like to party. And now... They've lost their family, they've lost their business, they've lost everything. Because we've never been slaves to anyone. We all do the same thing. You see, Christians can be in bondage and it's difficult to admit it when we're in bondage. Come on, you're still out there, say amen. Amen. It's got really quiet because I know some of you are like going, who's he talking to? Is he talking to me? Let me give you the third, third concept here in this passage, and that's this. Jesus can free you from bondage. Come on, that's good news. Somebody say amen. amen. I like what he says in John. John chapter 8, verse 35 says, if the Son sets you free, you won't be on a leash. You won't be on a longer leash. You'll be really free. Free in Indeed. Can I stop and tell you something? Jesus came to set you free. In fact, let me show you his words, which were written prophetically by the prophet Isaiah. And when he began his ministry, he declared what God had said about him, his father, years and years ago. Here's what he said. He stood up in the synagogue in um, the book of uh, Luke chapter 4. And here's what he said. He began his ministry to make sure everybody knew why he'd come. He said, the spirit of the Lord is on me. Because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. That's not just people who don't have money. The Bible says in his teaching on the, the, uh, what is it, the Sermon on the Mount. 
He says, blessed are the poor in spirit. You see, he came to bring the good news that you can be saved and forgiven. So he came to forgive us from our sins, to help the poor in spirit. But then it also says, he also sent me to proclaim, what's the next word? Freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight to the blind and to set the oppressed free. Let me just make it clear. Jesus did not just come to forgive you of your sins. He came you to free you from the power of sin. So the question then remains, and this is what we're going to do for the last 19 minutes of my sermon. Actually, 1855, 54, 53, I better get going. We're going to talk about how does Jesus set us free? Because I would bet that there's someone in this room or someone joining us online that has something in their life that if it came down to it and you're honest with yourself, you'd say, I don't want that in my life anymore. I'm tired of that affecting me. I'm tired of falling to that weakness on a consistent basis. God wants you to be unleashed. Somebody say, unleashed. So how does Jesus do it? Well, I'm going to take a story in the Bible where he literally set someone free. He literally unleashed someone. And from that story, I'm going to give you three principles of how Jesus can set us free. I'll set up the story. There was a a friend of Jesus, and his name was Lazarus. Lazarus became sick. Jesus was out doing ministry, and so they sent word and said, hey, Jesus, you need to come back. Lazarus is sick. If you don't pray for him, he's going to die. I don't know what will happen. You better come quick. Well, Jesus doesn't come. He waits. In fact, the Bible says he waits on purpose. By the time he gets back, Lazarus is dead. And when he gets back, the voice that came out of humanity, which we've all felt, is, Jesus, where were you at? If you had been here, if you'd have done it the way I wanted you to, if you'd have showed up on my timetable, if you hadn't disappointed me with your plan, I don't see your plan, if you'd have done my plan, Lazarus wouldn't be dead. Because we all have moments of disappointment. And so what does Jesus do? He responds, and here's what he says. He says, you know what? Here's the reality. I tell you what. Take me to where this death is. Take me to where this bondage is, because the Bible says that they placed him in a tomb, and they rolled a stone in front of it. So he said, take me to the tomb. And so he goes to the tomb, and when he gets to the tomb, here are the three things we're going to discover from Jesus of how he can set us free, because how many know that God doesn't want us to live a leashed life? He wants us to be unleashed. So what's the first thing that we can allow God to do, Jesus to do to set us free? Number one, write this down. We need to let Jesus expose it. True freedom is when we let Jesus expose it. You say, where do you get that, Pastor Jerry? Well, let's continue the story. So he gets to the tomb. Now watch what happens. Jesus tells them, roll the stone aside, Jesus told them. But Martha The man's dead sister protested. And in fact, I didn't put it on there, but you know what she says in the the King James Version? She says, no, 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 you can't open the stone because if you roll away the stone, if you expose this thing, here's what she says, he stinketh. It's a funny word, isn't it? Try to use that in a conversation the next week, two or three times. Stinketh, think about it. He stinketh because the human nature says, no, 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 no. You don't want to see what, what I'm hiding. No, no, I can't show anybody because if I show somebody, they won't like me. If I show somebody, they're going to think I'm a bad person. If I show somebody, I'm going to look horrible. And our nature is we got to hide it. We got to keep the stone in front. We don't want anybody to see what's really going on in our life. And the reason many of us are still on our leash is because we don't let Jesus expose the sin, expose the weakness. Come on, we know even in the 12-step program at AA, what's the first step? You have to admit that you have a problem. No, 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 I don't have a problem. I've got this under control. And how many of us today are still bound because we haven't let Jesus expose it? I'm telling you, when you get close to Jesus, he'll help expose the things in your life. You see... I had a, um, my, my wife, Devette, her grandpa, his name was 
Dave Yancey, and he was just a man's man. He wasn't big, but he was a man's man. He worked for PG&E, and he had a big shed in the backyard where he built stuff, and he had hands like rocks. I mean, they were just, he was just a man's man, and, and a period of time came when he started not feeling well, and people were like, you need to go to the doctor and see what's going on. And he's like, no, 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 I'm good. And he, no, you need to go to the doctor. No, no, I'm good. And he just fought it, and he fought it, and he fought it until finally he got so sick. We're like, you're going to the doctor. And they finally take him to the doctor, and you probably know what's going to happen here. They find out that he has stage four pancreatic cancer and just no, opera- no, no pill- possibility for operation, and he only lives a few more months, and he passes away. Because you see, here's kind of the principle of why you need to expose it. You can't heal what you're not willing to reveal. Jesus can't heal what you won't reveal. So what God is teaching us is if we're going to find freedom, we have to have the courage to say, Jesus, come on in and take a look, turn on the spotlight and evaluate, is there something going on in my life? If we need to roll back the stone, if you need to put a floodlight in the front of the tomb, God, I'm tired of living in darkness. I'm tired of being in this place that I am. I'm tired of this hopeless situation. You can be free, but you have to let Jesus expose it. Come on, somebody say amen. amen. Second thing you have to do if we're going to be free is we have to let Jesus address it. Let Jesus address it. Look at what it says in in John chapter 11. So Jesus says, roll away the stone, expose this thing. Air it out a little bit. And then the next thing, then Jesus, what's the next word? Shouted. Shouted. There's only like three of you. Let's try that again. Then Jesus what? Air, woo, that's pretty good. Why don't we act like we know what the word means? Then Jesus, there we go. Lazarus come out and the dead man came out. Now, here's the point I want to make right here is that Jesus addressed the problem. They allowed Jesus to speak to the issue. That's why we have prayer teams. And if you have a sickness in your body during worship, you can go over and get prayer. And people will pray over your sickness. When it comes to areas of addiction and strongholds in our lives, you need to let Jesus speak to your problem. You see, Jesus is the, is the, the way that you find freedom. The Bible says that he is the, the, the way and the truth and the life. In fact, let's go back to our other passage. Look what it says in John. He says, if you hold to my teaching, you will really be my disciples. Then you will know the truth and the truth will set you what? Free. So here's the thing. Freedom comes not from truth. It's when we know truth. And you can't know the truth that God has for you if you don't let the truth speak it into you. Jesus needs to speak into your hopelessness. Jesus needs to speak into your addiction. Jesus needs to speak into your unforgiveness. Jesus needs to speak into your fear. The problem is is that we live our life with the lie instead of living our lives with the truth. We let the lie speak into us, but not the truth speak into us. I'll give you an example. Well, Pastor Jared, I know I got an anger problem. And I know it's it's a problem. I mean, I've I've lost a job over it. I'm now divorced. Can't see my kids. But you don't get it. I'm Irish. It's just the way I am. It's in my genes. I'd talk with an Irish accent, but you'd laugh at me. (laughs) I got the luck of the Irish. Praise God for shamrock shakes. Just throwing that in there. How many are thankful when the shamrock shake comes around? Okay, just thank God for the Irish. I guess a lot of you don't like shamrock shakes. I love shamrock (laughs) shakes. That's just the way I am, Pastor Jared. It's in my genes. It's who I am. And so here's what we do. We live in the lie rather than letting the truth speak to us. Because here's what the truth says. The truth says, no, 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 no. If you're in Jesus, old things are passed away and all things have become new. You are a new creation in Christ. 
You see, God wants to speak. Jesus wants to speak and address the issue that's going on in your life. So he tells them, he says, take me to the place of hopelessness because I'm going to speak to the place of hopelessness. Take me to your place of death. Take me to your place of addiction. Lazarus, I know the world's telling everyone that you're dead, but I say you're alive. I know everyone's saying that it's fear, but God has not given you a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. You see, we need to let Jesus expose it, and we need to let the word, Jesus, the truth, when we begin to educate ourselves through the power of Jesus, through the word, Jesus is the word of God. So when you get the word of God into your life and you begin to educate and know truth, truth will set you free. Somebody say unleashed. unleashed. So let Jesus expose it. Let Jesus address it. And then I'm gonna give you the last one, all right? And that's this. Let others help you. In other words, freedom involves letting other people be involved. It's tough to do freedom alone. In fact, if you read the story, watch what happens. This is exactly what happens. So Jesus calls out, the, exposes the issue and helps him expose it. Secondly, he, he speaks to it and says, come out and he does he comes out of his tomb and when he gets out of his tomb watch what happens the dead man came out but his hands and his feet were bound in grave clothes his face was wrapped in cloth and then Jesus said let me me stop right there there's a lot of people who have gotten saved they've been forgiven but they're still living at the standing at the edge of their tomb And they wonder why they're not running. They wonder why they're not accomplishing all that God has called them to accomplish. They wonder why they're not free to to move and do and be what they're supposed to do. It's because they've allowed that struggle, that bondage, those things to continue. And they're still on the leash and they're still standing on the edge of the tomb. Can I tell you, God didn't call you to stand at the edge of your tomb. He didn't call you to live with just enough. He called you to live with more than enough. He can do exceedingly abundantly above all that you ask or think according to his power that's working within you it's time for you and I to move beyond our tomb quit living in bondage and standing at the edge of your tomb yes you're not dead anymore in your trespasses and sin but are you free so what did Jesus say he didn't say be free he said to the other people Unwrap him. Because freedom is about letting others help you. I, I, I'm reminded of the story last weekend that we had on video about a, a precious lady in our church. And um, it was the story of how she was at the, uh, the shooting in Vegas. And when she came back, I don't know all the details, but I was kind of given a, an example of what the story was. And in a nutshell, the effect and the trauma of that was literally keeping her in her home where she couldn't come into a, a crowd at church anymore. She couldn't, I don't know what, what happened with her job. It sounded like it was a struggle with her job. And when she literally was in a tomb, metaphorically, and she couldn't get any change. And one day, she was able to make it to church, and it just so happened on that weekend. Guess what? Jesus addressed that issue. And the idea was, listen, don't live in isolation. You need to get in a circle. Why do you think at Higher Vision we're always talking about get in a circle, get in a small group? Why? Because you need people that can unwrap the things that you could never unwrap yourself. And so she said, you know what? I'm, I'm tired of being in my tomb. She went to a circle and, you know, here's what's crazy, is that God began to heal her, and began to transform her and unwrap her. She, in her story, you could see the life just in her. And you know what's crazy is that now, not only is she able to move and do and be and come to church and go to her circle and do her job and have family and people are calling her from the, the shooting that are still in their tombs going, hey, can I go to church with you? What, what happened to you? How come things have changed for you? Why does God not want you to live in bondage? Why does he not want you to live at the front of the tomb? Because if you read the rest of the story, and I don't have time to tell it now, all of it, but I will tell you this. When he finally got unwrapped, it was not long after that that Jesus 
went into Jerusalem, remember? And they sang, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And there was a massive crowd of people that welcomed the Messiah. Guess who was with him when he went? Lazarus. And if you read the count in the Gospels, here's what it tells us. In fact, this is an interesting verse that most people don't realize. Much of the crowd showed up not to see Jesus, but to see Lazarus, the man that Jesus had risen from the grave. The point I'm making is the reason God wants you to be free is not just so that you can be free, because when you get past the entrance of your tomb and you find freedom, you become a magnet to draw people to Jesus. That's why we have a program here, this church, called Celebrate Freedom. It's a, it's a circle that meets every week, and they pray for each other, and they develop principles of learning to live in freedom if they've struggled with any form of addiction or, or stronghold in their life. It's why we're, we're looking at starting in the new year a new circle that's, that's designed around cleansing stream principles, which is a, a ministry that helps people be cleansed of hooks and, and strongholds that are in their mind, habits that are in their mind, finding inner healing. And, and uh, if you're interested in something like that, then today at the end of the service, go talk to someone and get on the list or put, just take a, a, an envelope and write your name and say, I'm interested in the circle and put your name and phone number and when, we'll let you know when that circle comes. The point is, is don't try to be in freedom alone. God says you need to let others help you that's why the bible says and we're going to bring this to a close but the bible says in james chapter 5 confess your sins to who and pray for who why so that you can be healed the key to healing is others Don't pray alone, and then look what it says. Now, this is a powerful truth that we often miss. Because, or the principle then is, that the earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. Another translation says that the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. In other words, here's what this passage is saying, is that when you and I learn that we have people in our life, that we don't pray alone, that we're committed to relationship when others are praying with us, that is the ingredient that releases powerful and effective prayer. Some of us will never move beyond our tomb if we fight alone. Some of us will never move beyond our tomb if we pray alone. Because sometimes the way God sets us free is he has to have others unwrap you. I just want to give a visual to this idea. You see, you need the knowledge. You need to let Jesus speak his truth. You need to grow. You need to have people in your life. All of these things because... Here's what happens, and this is kind of an analogy the Lord gave me to kind of describe where a lot of Christians are. And here's what happens. We, oh, let me do it this way. So we begin to live our life, and as we live our life, oh, that's long. And as we live our life, we start making bad decisions, start building bad habits. Maybe something happened to us when we were young, and started us on a course where we started thinking and believing certain things or maybe we got caught in some kind of a addiction. The next thing you know, we're just all wrapped up, all wrapped up, bound to sin. And then now watch, Jesus, we show up at a place like this or someone comes and shares the love of Christ. Jesus shows up and he says, hey, I came to free you from sin, and he unhooks us. How many know sometimes we're still wrapped up? We're free, but we still all have all those patterns and all those habits. So here's what God says. I want you to be free from all of that so you can run. You don't need to be standing at the edge of your tomb. You need to run. So I want you to get some people in your life. I want you to get into the word. I want you to let me address the issue. I want you to expose things. And as you do, I'm going to start to unravel. Theoretically, unravel. 
So you go to cleansing stream and you learn what your triggers are when you're tempted and you go to classes and you realize the motivation behind what's going on. You learn to, how to pray, you learn how to build yourself up in your faith. Somebody say unleashed. God has not called you to be wrapped up standing at the edge of a tomb. He's called you to run and wave palm branches and say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So I want to end with this. Worship team, you guys can come on out. There was a man that went to a market many, many, many years ago. When he got there, there was a vendor, and the vendor was selling doves. And as he looked at this group of doves, they weren't in a cage. They were um, tied up to a pole. There was a pole, and a string was tied from the top of the pole to the leg of the dove. And so the doves would just kind of walk in a circle, and you could see the path from their walking. If they'd try to fly away, they'd fly and hit, you know, hit the tension and come back down, and they just walked around in circles, and it just kind of broke his heart, like, oh, man, these doves need to be able to fly. They need to fly. So he goes up to the man, and he says, hey, man, I want to ask you a question. How much is it for all those doves? The man thought about it. He said, you want to buy all the doves? He's like, yeah, I want to buy all the doves. Gave him the price, and he said, okay. He pulled out his money, and he paid him for all the doves. He said, they're yours. He said, okay, can I ask a favor? Do you have some scissors? He said, yeah. He walks over with the scissors and he starts cutting all the strings. He finished cutting the strings and he's like, fly, you're free. And to his amazement, they just kept walking around in their circle. Because they were free, they just didn't know they were free. So he looked at the doves, he looked at the sky, and he ran into the middle of the doves and he started shushing the doves. He's like, shush, shush, shush. And he started shushing the doves, and suddenly in fear, they're like, and they fly away. And he's like, fly, fly. And as I was praying about the weekend before we start all of our Christmas stuff, I felt like the Holy Spirit said, Jared. I'm going to echo my voice through you to people that are in this room and joining us online. And you know why I'm here? Shush! 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 You don't have to stay where you are. You don't have to walk around in your circle. You don't have to live on the edge of your tomb. Shush, go fly. It's time for you to fly. The Holy Spirit, through the power of Jesus Christ, has given you the freedom to move beyond where you are. Somebody say unleashed.